Good evening and welcome to this week's edition of The Fourth Estate. My name is Raymond Mujini, your host, and every week we get to critique how the media covered the big stories. What we're looking at today, how the media should cover the 2021 election campaigns that will prove to be scientific. And we also have a keen look at how the radios will cover the 2021 general election. The Ugandan Electoral Commission this week released a revised roadmap for elections which gave the media an upper hand in the dissemination of information from prospective candidates to their prospective voters. This upper hand that the media has will give them close scrutiny in terms of delivery on both quality, content and control of how candidates access the voters. We look very closely at how the media covered the 2016 general election and all the failures that haunted it then and whether those failures have gone away. <laughs> The announcement that the highly billed 2021 election would be conducted scientifically brought with it more questions than answers. It was principally contested by the leading opposition figures for not being inclusive and accommodating, but was also shot down by legal experts as a legally contestable amendment. Everybody is sanitized and, and with social distance, so that smaller meetings of 200 people, a presidential candidate can go to Palisa town, meet people maybe from each sub-county, give them a message before they go around to do a radio discussion. Yeah, but you see, if there are areas which people are meeting are cross-setting, markets, Chukubo, malls, and whatever, even the campaigns can be done so that when we were going to do a campaign, there's a distance of far, and that's how we can deal with it. We say the campaigns, the candidates must campaign. They must propagate their message to the voters. They must convince the voters. The health experts say, ah, Chiamani, you are finishing us. One aspect of it, though, the one which this program will pay keen attention to, is the role that the media would be drafted into play in such an election. Uganda's media is no stranger to election cycles. It is, in fact, the most powerful tool in creating perceptions and sustaining the messages of candidates. The media also plays an important role of an auditor in elections, holding candidates to their promises and debunking the myths of their messaging. All candidates, mostly at the high level, pander to a good media strategy to make their campaigns work. Yes, Joshua, talk to me. Your thoughts on this? The unique aspect of the 2021 elections would demand that the media plays an adjudication role and sits at the heart of providing nearly all the information that the public will rely on to make the 2021 election decisions. But the media has been tested before on its ability to adjudicate an election, and the results were not pretty. In the lead-up to the 2016 general election, the media development organization, African Center for Media Excellence, monitored the behavior of the media for close to six months. They produced a comprehensive set of numbers for how the media allocated time across candidates and how each of the platforms, from TV to print and radio, behaved. The combined number of stories produced was 10,355 stories across 47 media houses, which in itself was a very low number. Radio, which is the highest consumed platform by Ugandans, produced the least number of election-related stories. Whilst the parliamentary election drew out more candidates and voters, there was a very disproportionate allocation of time in the media to the presidential election tipping into four times more than the parliamentary election. The incumbent, Yoweri Kaguta Museveni, across all platforms got the highest coverage against his opponents. And the measure got even worse when it came to the national broadcaster, the Uganda Broadcasting Corporation. But the media failed more grossly in its sourcing role. The predominant space was allocated to men as sources of election stories in an election where a majority of the voters were in fact women. So can the media be relied on as a natural and neutral arbiter of election campaigning for candidates? This is uh, unprecedented, uh, maybe because we are living through unprecedented times. Uh, a new virus, the lockdown, uh, social distancing and um, all this new environment we are living in. Um, uh, first of all, I'm surprised that the uh, Electoral Commission or the government has decided to uh, plow ahead and uh, have elections um, early next year. Uh, probably they could have thought of um, 
changing the relevant laws or even the constitution to, to move the elections maybe towards the end of 2021. But here we are, they have decided the elections must go ahead and therefore campaigning must happen and that campaigning will happen on, um, on media. Now this has never happened before. Media has just been one of the many tools that candidates use to get their message out, to reach their potential voters. Now the media is going to be the only campaign method, the only campaign tool. Now this puts media in an interesting position where the media will become the main arbiter in these campaigns, the key arbiter in the campaigns. Uh, that means a lot of pressure on media, that means a lot of responsibility. So there are several things we can uh, speak about, one pack, what this all means. Uh, I think one is for the candidates, uh, a lot of people who go into politics uh, thrive on, 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 on crowds, uh, either speaking at mass rallies, smaller rallies, going door to door knocking, having smaller meetings, talking strategy, uh, raising money and all sorts of things. Now without a rally, and if the rally is your thing, you go rouse the people, you look at them, you see how they respond and, you know, tweak your message accordingly. You know, it's a sort of a back and forth, you know, that is, is being denied. So you have to do it entirely on the media. So even if you hire the best media advisors, that might be a disadvantage uh, in a way. But two, um, you have the issue of do all candidates, does everybody who will be campaigning know how to use media uh, to get the message out? If you know how to use uh, media, that's a good thing, but then there's a question of cost. If you don't know how to use media, it means you have maybe to hire some people to help you. How do you package this information to go out to the media? Which media platforms do you use? And also that is determined, of course, by which position you're running for. Are you running for uh, LC5 councillor? Are you running for MP? Are you running for president? Are you running for a special interest position? So there are all sorts of things to work through. Um, and then uh, there's the question of pay. Who is going to pay for all of this? Is the government going to meet the, the cost? Are individual candidates going to meet the cost? Where will that money come from? You know, this, this is, uh, because this is central to you campaigning. So you must uh, appear on media and you have to pay for it. Uh, obviously, this will help those politicians who have radio stations. Uh, this is going to be very good for them. Uh, they can hog all the airtime and uh, keep away the, uh, their opponents. Uh, but also for those who have friends, for candidates who have friends who own radio stations, maybe this might work in their favor. But for the rest, it's, um, it's going to be uh, uh, quite complicated. Now, coming to the media side of the equation, um, the media, like I said at the start, that the media will be the main arbiter of how these campaigns unfold. So. Um, if you have campaigns black, blanketing the airwaves, uh, blanketing uh, you know, print media and online media, number one, what happens to other stories? What happens to other stories that are important? Maybe locusts, maybe the rising levels of Lake Victoria and uh, associated environmental issues. Uh, you have COVID-19 still. And you have several other issues that, um, th th that come up all the time. Uh, so I think media will have to prepare and prepare hard for this uh, because then you also have obviously uh, disinformation, fake news. This is going to be unprecedented and so the media have to be really prepared uh, for this. Um, but also media will have, uh, going back to the issue of the arbiter, is you don't want the well-funded uh, parties and candidates, the bigger parties and candidates, the prominent parties and candidates, to hog all the uh, airspace on radio and TV and, and, and space in the, in the airtime on TV and radio and uh, space in the newspapers. Um, and uh, to the extent that the smaller uh, candidates don't have slots 
because I could come and say, well, they've said we are campaigning on, uh, on media, so I'm buying all the prime slots in, uh, on NTV, or I'm paying for the entire day on NTV, and, uh, you know, NTV needs money, and it does need money, so I'm paying. And I have that well, platform, it's a key uh, platform. Are, are but that's, that, that's the, the issue. Is the EC prepared to manage all these sorts of things? Have they thought through this? Obviously, you have the responsibility that the EC has, but also you have the responsibility that media owners have and media managers. Is, as media, I don't want to be seen to be the mouthpiece of only one candidate, however well-funded that candidate is, however much that candidate is ready to pay for airtime or for space. So you want to have as many voices as possible, the different contending uh, voices um, in, for any particular position. So that's a, a key responsibility for, 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 for media. Previously, we have seen um, uh, candidates being denied space on some of the radio stations by politicians, by, by RDCs, GISOs, and and, and, yeah, and, and I, I, you see, that, that's another key uh, challenge, that while this happened before, you know, uh, if you are denied space, you still had the chance to go and have your rally at the, at the BOMA ground, at the certain school playground that, you know. Uh, but now, you can't have that rally, you can't have that meeting, and yet, I believe that uh, this business of stopping uh, certain candidates from accessing media will continue unless there is a special, probably a presidential directive to RDCs, to district police commanders, that no such thing should happen. But it's likely to happen. So you may ha find candidates who they can't have rallies, neither can they access media in sort of an adequate way. So that, that, that's, again, uh, an issue that is going to have to be, to be resolved. And we don't have much time. These things have to be discussed and discussed now. And minimum standards agreed uh, and standard operating procedures, to use the, the lingo of the day, um, have to be, to be agreed across the different political groupings and parties. No, absolutely. I, th I think uh, the, the UCC likes to say we are proactive, we act proactively, and I think this is a huge opportunity for them to, I think, pronounce themselves on what is expected, on what would provide um, a level media playing field. For, for the different contending candidates. That's absolutely going to be, to be important. But I want to emphasize the point that even without the EC or the media council, there needs to be the media owners, media managers have to really appreciate uh, that this is a big responsibility that has been thrown at them. And they have to rise to the occasion and ensure that different viewpoints, different candidates who are contesting for the different offices can have fair, uh, they, they can have, uh, can be had fairly through the different media channels. Mm. They, I think that, that's a civic responsibility, but also that's a key media responsibility to be um, uh, an impartial um, um, uh, channel of, of views in, in society, and especially during election year in time. Normally the, the incumbent, especially on the side of the president, uh, the president, said those who are contesting for the position of the president, um, the incumbent always um, takes advantage of being an incumbent, and um, uh, we are likely to see him moving around the country because he's the president and he's addressing people. Yet others are told go and speak on radio, even which radio they have to pay money. <laughs> even he, you, but, mean, uh, I mean, you can't tell the president. You can't tell the president if he says I want to. To, to, to be hosted on the political radio station, and then you tell him to pay. There are always, of course, advantages of incumbency, and they won't go away. Uh, there is a, a, a twist, though, in, in this particular uh, instance, that the incumbent, if we're talking about President Museveni, who is, for all intents and purposes, a germaphobe, I don't think you'll see him leaving State House, going around... Uh, Touring, even if he did, that would be in very, very limited ways. Uh, I don't think he wants to get any, any new virus uh, out there. But obviously, he will package his messages and he will get his presidential unit supported by the rest of the uh, government infrastructure 
to have these messages out in the different radio stations and I don't think there's any radio station that is going to say no. So he will still enjoy uh, some advantages of incumbency, uh, which that is, uh, it's unlikely that another candidate running for president will just say, here I have my, my message and I want it to run on several, several stations, um, even if they're paying for it. Uh, so some stations will take those messages and take the money, some will not take the messages and will not take the money. So there are those inbuilt advantages I think won't go away. Uh, if anything, they may be slightly more pronounced uh, given the circumstances we, we are in. Uh, the only thing is uh, I don't see President Seven going out uh, campaigning. Mm. What, what would be your advice to those who intending to contest for various positions, taking advantage of um, this era of social media? <sighs> has its uh, negative and, and, and positive aspects of it. Well, um, I think even without COVID-19, um, in every subsequent election, we've seen uh, increasing use of social media. Um, and I think especially for Uganda, WhatsApp. Uh, it's no use repeating the fact that the Ugandan radio is the most consumed form of media all across the country. In the national census, it was estimated that there are 292 radio stations, but new data from Parliament, particularly from the ICT Ministry's presentation to Parliament, shows that there are 309 radio stations, the majority of them concentrated in the central region of Uganda. The radio will play a very critical role in the 2021 general elections, but just how ready is radio to mediate this role, but also how ready is radio to handle the institutional pressure that will come with handling a presidential, parliamentary, and local council election. 91.3 Capital FM. This is Alex in the morning with Kampala's Better Music Mix. Uh, look at other papers today. It seems we can't trust anyone today. The Ugandan Radio. It is as much a fascination as it is a source of information. In its year of independence, the Ugandan government got its first breath of radio waves with the launch of the Uganda Broadcasting Service, under which the Uganda TV and Uganda Radio were born. It flighted first as a national service radio, running basic programming on government events and occasions, but its serious bump would come in 1971. During the coup d'etat of Idi Amin, Radio Uganda, the widest access media platform, then would become instrumental in communicating both the decrees and the new law and the new president. Amin invested very heavily in creating color TV, mostly for propaganda purposes. However, years on, after the tumultuous reign of Uganda had crossed the iconic year of 1986, Radio Uganda started to get a serious competition. A global move to privatize entities appealed to the NRA government, which opened up radio frequency for private entities. The Kato family latched first at this step and created Radio Sanyu, following which the capital radio also came to the airwaves in 1992. The rest, like they say, is history. Today, the national censor says Uganda has some 292 radio stations. A document presented to Parliament last week expands that number to 309 radio stations. There's a radio handset in every Ugandan homestead and it is the biggest, strongest and most politically vibrant form of media. The radio has shaped national culture and perception and also influenced decision making at the highest levels. However, a new announcement by the Electoral Commission to have campaigns carried on media platforms risks making it the front line for political battles in 2021. There's a general sentiment that many radios in the country are owned by politicians who enter the 2021 race with an upper hand. But can radios be fair? Can they be relied upon? Do they have institutions to reject this political fighting? This week, Bayanga, the head of radio at the Nation Media Group, shares with us his thoughts. My first response was, wow. So we are here now, but then on second thought, is everybody on board? Because it's an interesting, it's an interesting exercise to have all the campaigns conducted on uh, radios, TV, online and all that. 
If everybody is ready for it, if everybody has been consulted, if everyone is on board, I think it will offer something different. Look at the number of people who attend rallies. Look at the number of people who actually vote. Personally, I've been voting for some time, but I last attended a political rally in 1996, but I've been voting in every election. And I, I believe many people do vote without necessarily attending rallies. So when you look at the number of people who vote, we have people voting in millions, but I, I'm sure not all the millions attend rallies. How do they get to know about their candidates? They get to find about their candidates, who they want to vote for, and the things they stand for from the media, from, re from listening to radio, reading the newspapers, following them online, and all that. So if candidates said, look, because of the circumstances ongoing and all that, let's go for radio, let's go for scientific campaigns as a way to make sure we have these elections, that would be good. But then if all the parties are not on the same page, then that becomes complicated. Then it becomes one party against the, the other one. And then I wonder how the EC will get to mediate through such an exercise where all the contestants are not on the same page. So when you come back to the radio stations, I would say a big percentage, and I want to be honest, I've been working in the media for some time. I've interacted with a couple of radio stations. We are through the National Association of Broadcasters. Maybe a, some number, a big number may not be ready uh, in terms of being able to stand and say, this is what we stand for. We were going to offer everybody a free chance. We're going to give everybody a fair chance, give them the footing on the platform, not because one is uh, this party, the other one is this party, or the one has more money and the other one doesn't have money. There's, if I may just give you some background, there's, there are two things, two contents we put out. There's a real pure editorial content, which is news, and then there's commercial content, which is paid for content. So when it comes to editorial content, what we're supposed to do is make sure if it's a race in Kampala Central, um, you have other candidates, each one of them getting a fair hearing, getting a fair chance on the platforms, being able to hear their voices, hear their opinions, and have their supporters also voice what they think. But then now when we come to paid for content, that's a content which you run for, who pays? But then if I may give you background, what we've been experiencing in the last, I don't know, 10, how many years? We've been having situations where the RDCs storm into radio stations and they prack out these opposition leaders from speaking. Have we immunized ourselves against that? How sure are we that we will be able to have people speak without them being pracked from radio stations? These small radio stations which can't, don't have a big voice to speak and they are hard, are loud and clear, would they be able to stand up against the RDC? Say the RDC, you can't, you know, Besiji has come to address the people in this area. You, so the moment we don't have those assurances, the moment radio, because radio, TV, and whatever, don't exist in a vacuum, they exist in a society. So if the institutions in the society are not playing on a level ground, I think it may be a challenge for the radio stations to offer every candidate a fair chance to be able to voice their opinions. There are a couple of radio stations which can stand their ground. KFM will stand their ground. Uh, Dembe FM will stand their ground. And, and a couple of other independent stations. But not many of us will be able to stand our ground and say, look, these are candidates with competing interests. They are up against the incumbents and they want to throw them out of their, uh, and, they, and they are really campaigning for their seat. So let's give everyone a chance. Some of them will be bulldozed and they will not give everyone a fair hearing. I'll give you an example. Back in the days in, in the early 90s when there was the CA elections, uh, you, most of you guys, you know him and the young ones may not remember him. Charles Romushana, he, wa he had just finished campus where he had been a good president where he was elected on a ticket, uh, they need a ticket. They need a basically guys who are poor, who are broke. Uh, and then, but he went in Rujumbura and he contested against the ISO chief, and he won the election. He won the election against Brigadier Jim Mwezi. By then, he was Brigadier Jim Mwezi. Odongo To, straight from Rumumba at campus, he went and won a seat, and he came to parliament as an MP. Those two guys who I am mentioning them, I'm sure there are a couple of others, they did not have money. 
but the ground was so level that anybody could contest. So are there guys with brilliant ideas who may not get that chance because they don't have money to pay for adverts, to, pay, to buy airtime and go on air and share their ideas? So that may be a challenge for some of them, but there's something that can be done. I believe there's something that can be done to make sure everybody with the brilliant ideas, good programs are not locked out of this because of the scientific campaigns. Institutions like Electoral Commission, they need to come up with the guidelines of how this will be done. The, uh, the Communications Commission needs to come up with the guidelines of how this will be done. And everybody needs to, even the media houses, need to sit together and say, look, what are we going to do? Do we give the guy who comes and buys all the airtime all the time and we close out the guys without, air, without the money? Maybe not. And then the guys without money, do we give them free airtime? That's, that, that's, that's something that I, 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 we don't know how it will work out. We are yet to sit as a media house and discuss how we'll go about that. And it is something that we should do because I believe we need a free and fair exercise, whether scientific, organic, or whichever other name you use. Because I don't believe in people saying that politics is an exclusive club for the rich. Politics should be a club for people, a ground where the guys with brilliant ideas, good leaders, are able to come and sell their plans and their programs and for the voters to be able to make a choice from an informed point of view, not just because somebody threw around the most money is the one you had from morning to evening and then they go through. But then even when it is this scientific campaign, I think we need to do a hybrid. I, I, I don't think we are at a point where everything should be exclusively scientific. Look, for national elections, maybe it may work because these are guys, most of them, uh, the, so far the people who have shown interest, they are well known across the country. But what about the guy who has been a civil servant for the last 25 years and he's entering into a political into a political race for the first time and is looking for the votes for the first time. He, his family may know him, his village may know him, but not many people may know him. So even if they hear of his programs and all that, it may not suffice. We, we can't operate this thing uh, out of like we are coming from Mars and we are dropping down here. Let's, let's understand our people. Our people work well with the people they've seen. We easily identify with somebody we've heard about, we've seen them, and we've seen them work in our community. That's the people, those are the people they tend to vote for. So if we are going to do this scientific campaign, we need also to, uh, I'm sure the health experts will guide by the time we get to vote at the beginning of next year. People, if, if we need to work out a plan where people will be able to have a chance to have this face to face. We can have most of the campaigns scientific on radio and all that, but have a provision of people having at least one, two, three rallies to be able to interact with their people and maybe manage the numbers. But then we can do, when it comes to the, the part of EC, where it is voter education, voter sensitization, driving people to the most of the, of the electronic platforms which EC has put up, which I, I've checked them up. I've checked all my voter details all the time. I've never had to go to any of the polling stations and all apart from the time when I was registering. So that's good. EC can popularize all their platforms and people will go there. They don't have to do voter education through rallies, through whatever, uh, uh, you know, uh, these um, road trips and all that. They don't have to do that. They can do that scientifically. Now for the EC it may work. For the elections of uh, LC1 chairman and all that, I don't think they have money to afford buying airtime. That may not work. For the councillors, it may not work. For the MPs, some rallies, some aspects of it, but not everything. So a hybrid would deliver a good scientific election if other parties have agreed to go that way. So when you look at the previous elections, the different election petitions, some of the issues that have been heavily contested, some of the things that the petitioners have brought in their petitions is one, the use of money, the violence um, during the campaigns. So now, if we go to scientific elec campaigns, scientific elections, is this going to be the solution? Would they, the scientific campaigns, would they offer the answer to money? 
I don't think it's offering, an, uh, uh, so far I'm not hearing how it's going to offer the answer to the use of money. Because the guy who has been in parliament over the five years earning an average of 20 million per month and their expenses and all that, but they definitely have more money. You'd say they have more money, they have more sources they can easily get contacts who will fund their campaigns. Definitely they are most likely going to have an advantage over the new entrants. So the guys who are getting in, the guys who have lots of money, they will still have an advantage over the guys without money. The violence against the, the voters and intimidation and all that, will the scientific campaigns and the scientific elections offer that solution? I don't think so, because some of this intimidation is on the village level and it's door to door. So what we need to look at is we get these scientific campaigns, but then it shouldn't be scientific campaigns because we don't have another option. It, be, it should be an approach that we take that is going to offer a better solution and give us a better free and fair election that Uganda needs. We, we should not just go to radio and TV and all that because it's the only option. No, every election should be better than the previous one. So if radio and TV and online and, 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 and all other forms of media are the things which will give us a better election, well, I'm for it, but I'm for whatever we do, we should make sure we deliver to Ugandans a freer and a better election than the previous ones we've had. Thank you for joining us on the fourth estate this week. Of course, every week we get to leave you with what's happening in the digital world and we'll show you what's happening in that world. But for me and to you, have yourselves a good week ahead.